Welcome to Taste Buds. I'm Deborah Eckerling, goal strategist, writer, and foodie. And today I'm speaking with Chef Rossi, founder of The Raging Skillet and author of The Punk Rock Queen of the Jews. I mean, how much do we love that title? I'm, I'm mental over it. I really am. You are a chef. You are an author. You are like all so many things. And you want to give everybody the short version of who you are? Well, um, I guess I'm known in New York as the rebel anti-caterer. That's what the New York Times called me, a new breed of rebel anti-caterer. And the Zagats called me the wildest thing this side of the Mason-Dixon line. So I kind of love those. But I'm also um, a writer. My first memoir came out in 2015 called The Raging Skillet, which is the same name as my company, actually, The Raging Skillet, kind of cool. And that was adapted for the stage and became a play and has traveled the country and been a smash hit all over the country. We just had our first off-Broadway reading starring Judy Gold. It was a big, I think it was a big stretch for Judy Gold because she's a loudmouth Jewish lesbian from New Jersey and she had to play a loudmouth Jewish lesbian from New Jersey. But that worked out pretty great. And now we're hoping to have a permanent run off-Broadway one day soon. And then my memoir, my new book, The Punk Rock Queen of the Jews, just came out in April. The first one was like how I became Chef Rossi, my okay. wacky life. And it was a lot of behind the scenes of what it's like to be a chef and a caterer. And I ended each chapter with some kooky recipes relevant to the chapter. So if I'm in Georgia the day Elvis dies, I ended it with like Southern road food recipes. And I would probably say The Raging Skillet was sort of G-rated or PG-rated, like a 12-year-old could read it, and so could a 65-year-old or any age. Um, the new book, I would not say that about. This one, I think maybe you got to be a little older to read it, probably 16 and up. It's a little more R-rated. And in some ways, it's the prequel to The Raging Skillet, but really, it's just a whole different animal. I never quite wrote anything like that where I made myself so vulnerable. I said things in writing I've never said before. And it really is the true story of what happened when I was a wild punk rocker and my parents wanted me to be a nice Jewish girl with 1950s values and it wasn't working out. So uh, I ran away from home. I had a big giant party, which is what you do when you run away from a repressive home. And the police busted my party and my parents got the bright idea to ship me off to a Hasidic rabbi in Crown Heights, Brooklyn in 1981, who specialized in taking in and turning around wayward Jewish girls. And um, you can see that worked really well. But I met, I had to stay with the Hasids for two years. And what happened in those two years became this book, The Punk Rock Queen of the Jews. It's kind of a wild story. And I don't want to tell you too much because I want you to read the book. Well, I, I'm already, you know, totally invested in this. And I was exactly going to say, well, we see how well that worked out. So <laughs> I'm going to do that. What do you really hope people get from reading your book? Well, I think... I'm, I'm in my heart. I think that someone who's a, a young man or woman who's living in a repressive society or religion or family who maybe feels in their heart that they're not exactly heterosexual and just is feeling bullied and scared and, and worse of all, maybe thinking of ending their life would read my book and feel a lot of courage from it and inspiration. And that's what really warms my heart at night to think like, even if I could give that to one teenager who's depressed and sad and scared and thinks they might be gay, that, that would just make everything worthwhile. So like, even doing the book, I wish so much that I had been able to read something like that when I was 16 years old, because I felt very often like I was the only person in the entire world who understood what I was going through. It's so important, I think, when people go through trauma, and it was trauma. I mean, I love that, that you're so lighthearted about it, but it's especially in that phase of life where you're figuring out who you are, to have someone who's like, I've been there, I knew who I was, People, other people didn't, right. so you're okay. I, it's so important, especially in this 
cuckoo headed world we live in. Some days okay. like, it feels like we've taken 10 giant steps backwards. Like, I can't believe it. My, my girlfriend and I spend a lot of time in Florida in the winter as Jewish snowbirds do, of course. And well, she's a snowbird. I'm a snowflake. I just go back and forth. She gets to stay for a long time. But I'm just astounded this whole don't say gay thing. And we met a beautiful young woman who's married to her, her wife. And they've been together for like 15 years. Just a gorgeous woman. She's a school teacher. And she said she had to hide all the pictures of her wife and her family or she would be fired. And this is like 2024. I, to hear things that seem like they'd be more appropriate in the 1950s just breaks my heart. And there's so many people out there who really would like to strip away whatever gay rights we have managed to get. And a lot of people who want to strip away any protection for transgender people. And the, sometimes the worst culprits are the ones who are hiding behind religion. So, I mean, I'm Jewish probably as to my soul. Like my friends feel like I'm the most Jewish person they know. I don't know about that, but I feel like it's an essential part of who I am. It's deeply embedded in my DNA. But um, the hypocrisy of people I encounter who keep kosher and go to shul on Shabbos, you know, I'm Ashkenazi, I'm saying Shabbos, not Shabbat, and Davin and everything, and yet really, really want to oppress women, really want to hurt gay people, really want to just do all these horrifying things. I feel like in the end, you know, if you say to God, well, I davened every day and I kept kosher. And God says, well, were you good and kind to people? And your response is only if they're Jewish and heterosexual. God's going to be like, you're out of here. And if you, you know, meet God in the end and say, listen, I got to admit, you know, once a week I would have a ham and cheese sandwich and I only got to shul on Rosh Hashanah and never on Shabbos, but I was good and kind and loving and generous every day of my life, God would say, welcome, you may pass through. I love that. I, I, I love that, especially that your heart is just so open especially with all of your ups and downs and becoming you. So how can people be more <laughs> like you? And, and I'm talking like all people, you know, really sure of who they are and putting themselves out in the world. You know what it is? Everybody's good at something. What I happen to be good at, I believe, is uh, talking on the radio and writing and writing books and writing essays and doing podcasts and radio shows. So that would be my platform. But my girlfriend, her, her ability, I think she would have been a fantastic therapist. She kind of is a part-time therapist. Her ability is something that I'm not good at, which is that she can talk to someone who has a completely opposite point of view and listen to them and make them feel listened to, but then slowly explain how there might be a better way of thinking. And so she wants to change the world one person at a time. And I'm, you know, a little too impatient for one person at a time, but that's her talent. So your talent is you're a writer and you're a podcaster. So you have a platform to speak out about kindness and, and speak out against anti-Semitism. Someone else's greatest talent might be baking chocolate chip cookies. So they could go out on election day and give everyone who votes a chocolate chip cookie. Like, don't stay home, vote. You know, there's always something. So my advice is find the thing you're good at and use that for, for uh, weaving in kindness and love into this crazy, angry, screwed up world. I love that you brought up cookies because <laughs> this is taste buds. So I feel like we need to talk about food. What is it about food that feels like love? Well, it, I feel like that's sort of my whole motto to me. Like I, I signed most of my, I, my first book, I signed every book, Food is Love. But the punk rock queen of the Jews, I realize is as much, much about being, as much as about love is love. So now I sign it, Food is Love is Love. Cram the two together. Um, I know when I was a starving artist trying to survive in Crown Heights, I would take a few dollars and my mother's care packages and somehow weave together a meal 
that would feed all my starving artist friends. And it was like for $3.99, I managed to put together a meal that fed 10 people. And they were so happy and they were so full of love and joy. Their stomachs were full. And it's a powerful thing, food. I always think people can taste when one of the ingredients in food is love, when you just kind of had a warm feeling in your heart while you were making it and just wanted to make it as special as you possibly could. You can also taste when there's no love in food. You, we've all gone to restaurants and tasted, had a steak maybe, maybe seemed like a perfectly cooked steak. And we wondered why our mouth was falling asleep while we were eating it. No love. Is there an ingredient to putting love into food? Well, I think that's actually, I probably not. If there was, I would make billions of dollars selling it. But I do have my own secret weapons. Like one of my favorite secret weapons is Frank's hot sauce, which is like buffalo wing hot sauce. I put it everywhere. Like I've gotten very famous for my mac and cheese. Should I talk about my mac and cheese? I think it is the perfect opportunity to talk <laughs> about your mac and cheese. All right. So we've all had mac and cheese. And, you know, that's a great combination, macaroni and cheese. We're off to a good start. But I like to take it to kind of a, a deep, long conversation. So in the kitchen, I'll make a roux where you basically saute over low heat, equal parts of flour and butter. But I always do this gluten-free because I'm famous for my gluten-free cooking. And so I like to do things gluten-free people can't normally have. So I'll make the roux of the flour and the butter, slowly cook it for a few minutes so it gets a little nutty. And then I slowly whisk in milk and I'll cook the milk until it starts to feel a little thick. And then I throw everything in there. I throw a Frank's hot sauce, Dijon mustard. Actually, very often I'll do that even at the roux stage. It sort of doesn't matter. I'll do Frank's hot sauce and Dijon mustard and then whisk in my milk and cook it until it's sort of feeling thick. And then I throw in grated cheddar and grated Monterey Jack and pepper Jack for a zing. And I'll hit it with Old Bay and paprika and celery salt and garlic powder and fresh ground white pepper and fresh ground black pepper and just to spice it up even a little more, some Tabasco. And you get this very spicy, cheesy, yummy, giant batch of cheese sauce, and then we'll boil our gluten-free macaroni and mix it up with our gorgeous cheese sauce and pour that in a big baking dish. And that is just a feast fit for a king. So it already, you feel the spice, you feel the mustard and the Frank's hot sauce and the Tabasco, all of that is gorgeous. But very often what we'll do is put it in the fridge and sometimes we'll put it into containers and put it in the freezer, it lasts forever. But we'll put it in the fridge and the next day, we if we don't feel like we're having a feast where we need mac and cheese, we'll roll it into balls when it's cold, dip it in egg eggs that we've whisked up and roll it in gluten-free panko breadcrumbs. And then we'll put it in the freezer and whenever we want crispy mac and cheese fritters, it comes right out of the freezer into and we'll fry it, fry them frozen. So it's like two levels of mac and cheese. Any day is a good day for mac and cheese. And we just learned how to make it better. So if you go to jewishjournal.com slash podcast, in addition to an article that goes with this conversation, you will get Chef Rossi's delicious mac and cheese, which I personally cannot wait to try to figure out. So is that, so going back to the secret ingredient, mm -hmm. is it, what is your signature ingredient? Or is it just pouring love into everything you make because you enjoy the process. Well, people who know me know that I'm crazy about mustard. I'm crazy about Frank's hot sauce and Tabasco. Um, I'm crazy about celery salt. I'm crazy about Old Bay. There's certain things I'm crazy about. but And those things show up in lots of things that I make. But I think the secret ingredient is just really taking the time. Because if you rush through it, you might not have the great balance and you want to really whisk it with a lot of love in your heart. I've, I've seen people do the same recipe after I showed them how to do it and they just get sort of a pot of cheese and they don't have all that other flavor. So you just want to keep a warm place in your heart. When I first started writing um, cooking columns, I've done a, a few magazines I've written cooking columns for. I told them to put on the music that makes them really want to shake their tuchus. 
and maybe not too fast or you'll shake everything up and then just get some love in your heart and shake your groove thing. So in the kitchen, we'll always be playing good 80s rock, like New Wave. I love Johnny Cash. I love Led Zeppelin, things like that. So a little bit of rock and roll goes into a lot of our foods. So when you put on, <clears throat> so when you put on the music that you love, doing something that you love, that's really the best way to pour in the love. Oh yeah, well the best way is to watch people eating it. Uh, go on. So, as a in New York, I'm I'm famous as a a wedding caterer, but rather an anti caterer because when I started catering in New York, wedding food was famously horrible. It might have looked okay, but it really tasted like linoleum. Like you would have that rubber chicken, you know, just we've all had horrible, terrible, boring uh, wedding food with no love or soul in it. And I said, why does it have to be like that? Why can't it be like the best restaurant or your best thing your mom ever made? So I catered a wedding and I just put a lot of love into the food. And the guests walked around saying, I can't believe we're having food this good at a wedding. And they told people and they told people. And the next thing you know, I was a wedding caterer, except that I'm also a mitzvah caterer. And I'm a mitzvah caterer for a very different reason, which is that I had such a crappy boss mitzvah that I decided no child should ever have to suffer as I suffered because my mother hired the sisterhood to do all the food. And so all my 12, 13 year old friends came and we wanted pizza and pasta and all the things kids want, right? But all we got was goulash and stuffed cabbage and Swedish meatballs with par of cream sauce. And it was really disgusting. And plus my mother took all the food home and we had to eat it for a year. So I take great delight in making sure no child has to suffer on their boss or bar mitzvah. <laughs> uh, uh, amazing. I love that so, so much. What is your earliest food memory? Ooh, that's hard. Well, there were a few things that my mother used to make that certainly were not these beautiful gastronomic things. Like nobody would say, wow, that's impressive. They were just things that she made because she was busy but we loved for whatever reason. So one thing she used to make, we always seemed to have ragu tomato sauce in the house. I think my mother must have had coupons for it. It's just like everywhere you turned was ragu tomato sauce. So she would take a slice of white bread. She would take a baking sheet. She would put slices of white bread on the baking sheet. She'd put a spoonful of ragu tomato sauce in the center of the bread. And then she would put a slice of American cheese on top and then put it in the broiler and the cheese would puff up and be kind of burnt on top and the hot, the sauce would be hot inside and she would give it to us and she just called it like, you know, our kind of pizza or some silly name like that. And it was, you know, kind of a stupid little thing, but wow, we loved it. We would do anything to get that burnt cheese ragu sauce, white bread thing. And um, there you have it. So there were other things she made, but nothing quite made us as happy as that particular thing. I think I know where your love of mac and cheese came from. Maybe. You might be right. It's old. <gasps> Do you have any other uh, food for thought uh, to get people excited about cooking and putting that love into what they're preparing? Advice on how to put love into what you're preparing? Yeah. I would say the first thing is before you start cooking, assemble your ingredients. So when cooking can become stressful is you're in the middle of making something, you're like, oh, I need this, I need that. And what I'm burning, like, go oh, get this and go get that. So just line up everything that you need for the dish right in front of you to make it less stressful. I also think making things that you can make a day ahead, especially if you're entertaining, takes away so much pressure. Like you can make a beautiful mac and cheese a day ahead or hours ahead. You can even make it weeks ahead and put it in the freezer and take it back can make gorgeous lasagna, things like that, like that remove the pressure. Oh my God, the guests are coming over. What do I do? It's not done yet. I'm like the queen of the day ahead. I'm the day ahead queen. I'm also a repurposing queen. So I love taking things that you would never think could be elevated to high-end cuisine and just giving them a new position of honor. i give you an example. Um, Ruffles Ridge potato chips, right? So that's just junk food. Now, what would be the naughtiest, really the most wrong thing you could do with sushi quality center cut tuna? 
Uh, I guess putting it with potato chips. So what I like to do is cut it up for tuna tartare, do a light dressing with just a little bit of sesame and tamari and a little wasabi and let it marinate for maybe 20 minutes and then put a serve at a spoonful on a ridge potato chip and sprinkle some sesame seeds for garnish. So here's like this very expensive, gorgeous tuna that we're now serving on a potato chip. And it's, you know, it's repurposing of the chip, but it's also wonderfully naughty. It's one of my favorite things to do. Calling back to something you said earlier. So in my other, in my other goal strategist life, I always say when you love what you do, it shows when you don't love what you do, it really shows really you shows. clearly, clearly love what you do. Um, and when you love what you're cooking, that's going to show in the food as well. I love this conversation. Thank you so much, Chef Rossi, for joining me today. Where can people learn more about you, your new book, and everything Chef Rossi? Oh, great. Well, you can always find me on Instagram if you're an Instagrammer at Chef Rossi NYC. It's all one word. And Chef Rossi NYC is also my Facebook page. And you can always go to the ragingskillet.com to see what I'm up to because I put news and updates there. And um, the Punk Rock Queen of the Jews, you can always find by going to bookshop.com. So that's rather than, I mean, of course, we all love Amazon, we have to admit, but bookshop.com will support local independent bookstores. And we really need to support our bookstores because what would life be without a bookstore? You know, that's like, there's a special place in heaven for teachers, nurses, and bookstores. Um, right now in New York, McNally Jackson is selling my book. They're a great, fabulous bookstore. There's a bunch of them. And The Strand, which is the famous Patti Smith vintage bookstore, which I love, is selling my book. But really, if you type in The Punk Rock Queen of the Jews, you'll find it pretty quickly. It, it sounds to me like, I mean, you obviously love your first book because don't we all love our book babies? Right. But it feels like this one is so mission driven for you. This one's different. I mean, this one is actually fairly terrifying because I never wrote anything where I laid it out, you know, my most innermost secrets so much as this book. So it's scary to be so vulnerable. But I know if you're not willing to um, put yourself out there, then why do it? So I just love thinking of young people reading some of the things that I shared. And this, I wrote about some things that no one ever writes about, you know, really um, in depth in a way that you know, I've never, I've never seen it myself. So I'm assuming most other people haven't either. And I just think it's time to put these stories out there. Absolutely beautiful. And congratulations, because you really could tell how dear this project is to you. So thank you again, Chef Rossi for your time today. Thank you for tuning in to Taste Buds with Deb. Don't miss an episode. You can subscribe on YouTube, iTunes, and or your favorite podcast platform. And as I said, you can go to jewishjournal.com slash podcast to get that wonderful mac and cheese recipe and read the article that goes with each episode. And you can learn more at tastebudswithdeb.com. So go cook with love because if you're tuning in, come on, you have to at least love food and cooking. Put it all out there. Until next time, bon appetit.